Hi everyone, welcome to another video. Um, thanks again to those who watch my videos and give me some feedback what they'd like me to review. Um, someone asked me to review this video, Beef Industry Study Finds Plant Protein Equal to Meat um, by Mike the Vegan. Let's see what he has to say. Today, a very recent beef industry funded study appears to show that plant proteins have the same muscle protein synthesis or muscle building effect as beef, AKA cow muscle. And with their hypothesis, they Yeah, so uh, let me just take a quick glance at this. Um, I'll be right back after looking at the study. Okay, let's be very clear about what the study is showing and what it's not. So let me actually put the study on the screen. Um, so this is the study he's referring to. Meals containing equivalent total protein from foods providing complete complementary or incomplete essential amino acid profiles do not differentially affect 24-hour skeletal muscle protein synthesis in healthy middle-aged women, right? So that's a long title. Um, if you're not a healthy middle-aged woman, of course, this may not be relevant to you, number one. Um, number two, if you're looking at how they're measuring protein, so what are they doing? They're giving people three different, they're giving the same people three different meals. I assume with adequate time in between and so on. And one meal is meat-based and the other two are plant-based. The plant-based ones, one has um, complementary protein sources. So like beans and bread or beans and rice or whatever. They've used beans and bread, it looks like. And then um, the third meal was incomplete. So just the beans and just the wheat, right? And uh, what they're measuring is FSR, fractional synthetic rate. So they're they're looking at the rate at which people are building muscle. There's muscle turnover every day. So after eating this meal, does it affect muscle turnover in 24 hours? It's a very, very limited question, and it doesn't answer some of the other questions that might be of interest, and we can get into in a bit. But let's go back to, to Mike here. They seem to have specifically set out to prove that these incomplete plant proteins would not be as good, but the results shocked even me. The results were not teeny. They were so, so from the beginning, he's assuming bad intent on the part of the researchers, right? So he's assuming that they were trying to prove that vegetarian proteins weren't good, which may be a safe assumption, but, you know, maybe they're actually genuinely interested in doing science. It doesn't seem like giving people the benefit of the doubt is uh, is his starting point. He's starting being, he's starting assuming that everyone's trying to swindle him. If I asked you what's the most important cell in the body, what would you say? Would you say the cardiac cell, the heart cell? Would you say the hep hepatic cell, the liver cell? <laughs> Would you say some kind of immune cell? Uh, the answer, my friends, is none of these. The answer of the most important cell in the body is stem cells because they can become any of those things and more. We are born producing stem cells, but unfortunately, as we age, our production of stem cells goes down. Fortunately, there is a way to increase our endogenous production of stem cells even as we get older. To find out more, click the link on your screen. Proteiny. <clears throat> so of course we're going to crack this study open and look at even those secondary results that they found in terms of glucose and insulin levels, as well as hunger and satiety. And we're going to frame this all in terms of a shifting landscape on plant protein research in terms of better results when we're talking about muscle building studies and changing positions by doctors as well. So let's just go. The study was published very recently in the Journal of Nutrition, and this was a crossover trial and also had a control group. So it was a little bit of an interesting design in which they randomized women to either a group in which they were randomly assigned to eat three different meals in different orders. And that was compared to the other women that were put into a control group, a little confusing, but this was on middle-aged women who were considered healthy. And they also had everybody, regardless of what they were eating, do 30 minutes of treadmill walking. Right. So some exercise, again, um, middle-aged women who are healthy. Um, listen, most of my Many of my clients are quote unquote middle-aged women. I think the average in that study was 56. Yeah, the average age is 56. So that's very much within the range of people that I see. But unfortunately, I don't see them healthy, right? Um, maybe that's just because who's coming to me and so on. But um, at this stage in human history, if you're in a developed country, especially being a healthy 56-year-old, I mean, you're the exception, not the rule, right? So that's interesting during this day that they did the test. So that way the exercise was standardized. And just to throw the funding right out there in the beginning, quote, this study was supported by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, a contractor to the beef checkoff. And I will say this study was not- so If you look at all the conflicts of interest um, named here, and I can show again, um, 
Sure, again, this tab. There's numerous conflicts of interest potential, including the Barilla Group, like a pasta company. Conflicts of interest on both sides or on all sides. Super large. It had 17 total participants, but I will say it appeared to collect a lot of data, which helped reach statistical significance for certain. So N equals 17. Uh, 17 people, not going to be a hugely influential study, this is it. Later on, I'll, I'll talk about other studies, maybe. Uh, depends what he goes into, but. We can have a look at, you know, meta analyses of different studies to actually give a better picture of what's going on here. Comparisons, like they actually took three muscle biopsy samples from their quad in a day. And then in terms of what these three different meals were, well, we have number one, which of course was beef that they're calling the complete protein. And then number two, which they consider incomplete, but complementary protein sources, which included navy slash black beans, as well as whole wheat bread. This is where you can see a little bit of the bias leak through because that meal itself became a complete protein, but they're still trying to make it seem inferior to beef. And then we have number three, which they say was incomplete protein, which was either beans or whole wheat. And then they had this separate low protein group where women were just given a meal of- So the word complementary, so what he just said, they're trying to make it look as though, it's actually, if you know how to read English and science, like that's not, it's not, there's nothing um, unclear about that. Complementary proteins that are hitting all nine essential amino acids, right? This is not, um, he's looking for misleading statements when there aren't any, at least for people who know how to read. Just five grams of protein, completely devoid of protein as a control. And you might be thinking what I was thinking, a meal that just uses whole wheat as the protein source is really weird. And I don't know anybody that does that, eats that way. But it is the case that they matched the total grams of protein. So these people were eating the same amount of protein from whole wheat. I can just imagine the- They were also matching calories, if I understood the, the thing correctly. Of course, calories is the wrong term. They use the term energy, which is also the wrong term. Um, but they're trying to hit the same. It's not like they're giving someone- a big meal of protein and the other, you know, nothing like a, a very small meal. They're trying to give similar portions, let's say, if I understood the study design correctly. Researchers sitting around thinking of this study. Oh, yeah, I'm thinking we'll do a study where we just hypothesize that plant proteins suck compared to beef. So, so Mike is just giving us an insight into his own warped imagination. This is not how scientists work, right? Um, he's just assuming that the whole world is out to get his um, pathetic, you know, vegan ideology and uh we don't care you can think whatever you want mike you know quick payday we'll all be good what are we thinking as a comparison meal i was thinking of just throwing them some straight whole wheat that's a classic plant-based protein source that those idiots fully rely on <laughs> But in terms of those people who were randomized to the three males, they were saying that they were provided with, quote, a complete amino acid profile over 24 hours. And just to zoom out here, I wanted to add that for you to not get a complete amino acid profile in terms of just meeting all of your essential amino acid minimums in a day, you have to be eating just a really unbalanced diet. and Like a vegan diet, yeah. See, these, these chronometer readings and so on, these are based on minimums that we're not really sure are minimums. Uh, minimums that were mostly calculated not in middle-aged women, mostly calculated in young men um, who were pretty good at, at turning over protein. So um, is what chronometer, or however you pronounce this app, chronometer, is that is that a good metric or not? We don't actually know, right? The chronometer shows us like, yeah, if you're eating 2000 calories of whole wheat, you're hitting almost every essential amino acid there, except you're going to be low on say lysine by a bit. But, but if you just add a cup of black beans in there, subtract the calories from wheat so that you're still at 2000 calories, you're slamming through everyone, you know, 130% of lysine met. So yeah, you have to really screw up and never in a day of documenting what I eat on chronometer, have I not gotten all of my essential amino acids? So anyway, let's move on to what even is. So again, that's according to an app, which is using minimums, FDA minimums, etc. cetera. Um, and we now think that those minimums are probably not that useful, certainly not correct 100% of the time. And especially in older people, they're really not, it's not a relevant metric. Um, you want to be using other metrics. Muscle protein synthesis and how are they measuring it? We'll go through this quickly. Muscle protein synthesis is simply our body turning amino acids that we eat or are in our body into muscle protein so they get integrated into the muscle cell. All right, let's not keep you guys waiting. I want to get to the main results here and that is muscle protein synthesis as measured by fractional synthetic rate. We'll talk about what that actually is in a second, but just know right now that as this study mentions, it is the gold standard for skeletal muscle protein synthesis measuring. 
And those results are, as they say, when comparing these three meals that have the same amount of protein, whether it was beef, the mixed plants, or the single plant sources, they say that they, quote, do not differentially stimulate muscle protein synthesis after a meal or daily. It doesn't say or daily, it says and daily. And that and is kind of important because you're only measuring in 24 hours, right? For those of us who have been on vegan or plant-based diets for a long period of time, and I was vegan for a long period of time, you don't see side effects. You don't see issues in 24 hours. You just don't, right? So telling us that they can synthesize muscle just as well as people who've had a higher protein meal, a higher meat meal, is that telling us anything of interest? I'm not so sure. Did I, you know, did we think it was going to be different? Um, does eating one meal, one vegan meal do anything or one low protein meal even? Does that do anything in terms of how your body is turning over stuff? I don't know. I don't think so. So translation, the study found that eating the same amount of grams of protein from whole wheat, straight up whole wheat, which again, people are not relying on from protein led to the same amount of muscle protein synthesis results. And again, they did this using fractional synthetic of rate which is really a general term for seeing how much of something is absorbed in a given amount of time. And in this case, it was how much of a particular amino acid, the essential amino acid phenylalanine was absorbed from muscle biopsies. And what we have to keep in mind, there was- So they're using a tracer, right? So that's interesting. So they're injecting something in these people. I don't know who consented to this. It sounds like an awful study. Multiple muscle biopsies, that's like taking stuff out of your leg with a knife, um, injecting some radioactive dye into your body. Um, but I guess if people had uh, informed consent, I guess it's fine. There's no statistical difference between these three meals, whether it's the beef, the complementary plant protein, or the incomplete plant protein. We can look to this chart, and we can see the incomplete on the right actually trending at the highest amount of muscle protein synthesis in that case. And that was over a 24 hour period. And to. So, again, 24 hour period, what does it tell us? Like, if. Um, Again, so thinking about this from my perspective, which as, is as someone who's coming from an anthropological and human evolution lens, et cetera, if you had a bad meal, right? If you, if you didn't eat well for a day, but you had, your body had lots of stores, right? Your body had lots of energy. Your body had lots of even amino acids stored in different places. What would an intelligent organic system do, right? It would say, oh, crap, you weren't able to hunt today. You weren't able to get your food today. We actually need to give you more muscle. You need to get more stronger or whatever so that you can do better tomorrow, right? One might, and now I don't know this. This is just a hypothesis derived from first, first principles. One might expect that the incomplete proteins might actually, in the short term, lead to, for example, more energy, um, more even muscle building theoretically, right? Again, I'm not so sure that a 24-hour study is that interesting from the perspective. If, if the question is, in the longer term, what is better for maintaining healthy muscle, muscle mass as we age? And I think that's the question I want to ask. That's the question I'm interested in because I'm interested in things like, like longevity and human lifespan, et cetera, and optimizing human health span. If you ask that question, this study cannot inform anything on that question. This study is all about the 24-hour window. And in as I say, healthy middle-aged women. So it's interesting, but um, does, it doesn't add to the. It doesn't add any, any. It doesn't have anything to say about the specific questions that I think we should be most interested in. To be fair, I will say that the incomplete protein didn't do quite as well in one sort of indirect sense, and that was the muscle protein synthesis right after meals. And we can see that both the beef one and the complementary plant one were statistically significantly different from the low five gram protein control. So it wasn't statistically significantly different from control, but also not statistically significantly different from the beef and complementary protein meals, but still not correct to say that beef outperformed the incomplete plant protein. So things that you can accurately say here, it's a little muddy. And now- So, so again, the perspective has to be what is the default diet? <laughs> the perspective has to be what is your default hypothesis, right? His default hypothesis obviously is that vegan protein is just as good as any other kind of protein. Okay, I can show studies that can question that hypothesis, not particularly this study, but other ones, right? We'll get to those in a bit. My hypothesis is humans will thrive on the diets that they evolved to thrive on, whatever those are, right? And, and depending on what your default is, you're going to have to challenge it in different ways. I'm just putting that out there because you know, if you already have a bias towards his bias, you're going to see this data a certain way. 
Um, but if you don't have that bias, then this data isn't particularly interesting. And just in terms of creating new muscle, surprisingly, our body is actually turning over about 1% of our muscle mass per day, which- Why is that surprising? I mean, do you, do you not read this literature? Like, it's surprising to someone who doesn't know anything about the human body, I guess. Sounds huge, especially when you realize that for the average person, about 40% of their body weight is muscle, which could, of course, be well over 100 pounds. But then once you subtract the water, et cetera, the average person is landing in at around 12 pounds of actual muscle protein on their body, which translates to about 54 grams on average in terms of the amount of muscle protein that's turned over per day. And you might be thinking, oh, yeah, you got to eat all that. And people are told, the average woman is told to eat 46 grams and average man 56 grams of protein per day. But it's so I suspect those averages, again, are too low because, again, those are derived from healthy young male populations. And most of, most of what I see is that most of us can benefit from going higher than that, right? At least a 30 gram bolus of protein every time you eat. And that's two or three meals. So whether you're eating two or I, I don't recommend anyone only eats one meal a day. Well, that's not true. Sometimes I do recommend that. But assuming that you're at, at, a, at, a, at a good weight, wouldn't necessarily recommend that. So you're talking about 60 to 90 as a minimum for men and women. Uh, grams of protein per day. It's huge to note that we don't have to get all of our protein from diet. We recycle it. In fact, as this study mentions, when our muscles break down, they supply amino acids back into the free pool, most of which are recycled and reused. So we're talking probably 28 or less grams of protein actually needing to be added to the system. So that's an assumption. So, so I just want to point out that what he's saying is not logical, right? What he's saying is absolutely true. You can reuse um, protein from muscle that's getting broken down and, and resynthesize that. That is absolutely true. Is that ideal? Is it optimal? Is it healthy? Those are questions we don't necessarily know so much. Is there Are there benefits to increasing protein beyond the minimum that you need just to maintain your current weight? We don't know the answer to that either, at least not based on the data that he's talking about. He's making a logical jump here that, okay, because we can turn over our own muscles, which is true, um, therefore we need to eat less protein is his is the logical leap he just made. And again, you have to show me more of an argument for that. What happens if you don't? What happens if you don't for longer than a day or two, right? This, this study is only informing on a 24 hour period, pretty weak uh, data. Um, now they also did some blood tests. They just looked at how many amino acids were ending up in people's blood after these meals. And it's no surprise when looking at certain essential amino acids that are just higher in this meat that they were given. They would have also been higher in soy than the plant products that were given as well, but that we of course saw higher levels, things like leucine. However, they say, quote, this did not translate into a greater breakfast meal area under the curve response for total amino acids, which makes sense because these people were all fed the same amount of total amino acids. Now, unless you're that control group that was just given five grams, but for the main three meals, the same amount. That fact in the study itself majorly calls into question the protein digestibility scores, you know, that have been used as an argument against plant protein by, say, Chris Kresser on Joe Rogan, for example. But they're often determined by giving animals uncooked, like grains and other products, and feeding that into calculations. Yeah, those need to be reevaluated. You know, and you've probably heard that having more of these essential amino acids. So, as far as I know, there's PDCAS and there's diets, right? PDCAS, I think, is more or less what he's talking about. It was through animal dissection, maybe putting a hole in the animal's uh, intestine at a certain point and measuring things. I'm not sure if the grains were cooked or if they were, uh, I think there was sort of these pure proteins, some of them, whey protein, isolate, et cetera. Um, but there's also diaz, which was done in babies and basically looking at baby poop to get a kind of measure of what, what was coming out, right? Um, and it was of specific interest at that point in time because they were looking at baby food, baby formula, et cetera, right? So I think he's oversimplifying the diaz PDCAS stuff, um, but he does have a point. That's how some of it is calculated. Acids make something superior in terms of muscle, et cetera. So why wouldn't we see actual better muscle protein synthesis? So again, how could you measure that in 24 hours, right? It is entirely possible that you don't see any effect in 24 hours, and you would see that effect in a week, two weeks, a month, six months, et cetera, right? It's possible. Uh, I'm not saying I know the answer to that, although I'll put some studies on the, um, I'll, I'll show some studies in a minute that might inform a little bit on those questions. I don't think these are questions that are fully answered, to be perfectly honest. When we're seeing an increase in these essential amino acids in beef compared to the plant proteins incomplete, et cetera. And one answer to that could simply be that we're peeing out most of these proteins, especially people 
over consuming proteins in a standard American diet. You know, each of these meals had over 20 grams of protein. It's very unlikely that people were going to be absorbing all of the protein that they were. So if that, so he showed an article on the screen saying that nitrogen in the urine is a problem. Nitrogen is a very important ingredient in fertilizer, right? So if, if we were clever humans and we were using our waste properly, that could be a plus and not a minus, right? So I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not actually convinced. I haven't seen the data showing that nitrogen in the urine is an issue, to be honest, for certainly not for health. Uh, for the environment, it might be a different story. But again, there are ways around that, including using human waste to fertilize our soil, which would be great. Eating, and so they were just essentially getting enough across all three of these groups to have the same result. And there's another area, at least looking at for an answer, and that has to do with other blood results, such as glucose and insulin. We'll talk about insulin in a second, its relationship to muscle growth, but just we see this glucose chart right here and people's gut response might be, oh my God, that incomplete protein group had higher glucose, clearly it's worse. Well, that peak was just 125, which is well within like a healthy peak response to a meal. Like over 200 would be- How do you know it's healthy? I mean, I, I agree, but like, where's the data showing that it's healthy, right? So what we have to keep in mind with glucose is that it's one of those things in the blood um, and we don't really know at what level in the blood it becomes toxic, but it, it is some level. And this is why many of us basically try and keep our carbohydrate intake to close to zero and allow the liver to put as much glucose in the body as it wants, right? Um, because that's the safest way to do it. When you're having exogenous glucose, you're always running the risk. By the way, this will be the case for all three of those groups because all three of them were taking carbohydrates based on the study design. So they're they're always running the risk of that glucose uh, acting like sort of broken, broken shards of glass in the bloodstream and causing problems. A diabetic blood sugar postprandial or after meal response, this is fine. But with that higher glucose, as you might expect, we could also see a bit of a higher insulin curve for that plant protein, especially the incomplete one. This is interesting because insulin is a hormone that is involved in growth, as this study mentions on the topic of insulin and muscle protein synthesis. Quote, insulin is a potent anabolic or muscle growing state. This is known. I mean, bodybuilders inject insulin. I don't know where he's going with this, but this is very, a very well understood phenomenon. Stimulus for muscle proteins and insulin deficiency leads to a protein catabolic state or loss with loss of muscle mass that can only be reversed by insulin. So that's what we see in type 1 diabetics. Again, this is nothing nothing secret. He's saying it as if it's some revelatory you know, observation. Uh, this has been known for at least 100 years, but longer, I think. Therapy. So the question is, are these insulin differences actually clinically relevant? And I would just go right ahead and say that we have a lot of mixed literature on the idea that adding carbs is going to increase insulin and help with muscle growth. And we have various studies giving people protein or protein plus carbs and measuring the difference. This study, for example, found that, quote, we conclude that ingestion of carbohydrates improved net leg protein balance after resistance exercise. Okay, so what? I mean, like, how is this, how is this even of interest, right? Carbohydrates will increase insulin. Insulin can be anabolic, meaning it'll help you put on uh, muscle mass, if that's your goal, it'll also help you put on fat, right? This is why when the bodybuilders are injecting insulin, that's never at their cutting stage. It's always in their building stage. And then after a while, they go on a stage where they basically eat nothing and they dehydrate themselves. So they actually, that's the cutting stage uh, where they, so they actually look good for showtime, right? So they lose all the fat mass during that cutting stage with low insulin. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's saying. This is basic human physiology 101 stuff. The effect is delayed and really not even that large, so it could just be missed. And also back to what we learned about protein being recycled and reused in our body, they actually say, quote, the improved net balance in the carbohydrate group was due primarily to progressive decrease in muscle protein breakdown. They're saying that the carb group in this case ended up just breaking down their muscles less, so it was more of a preservation situation. So again, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing, <laughs> right? Because what he's saying actually makes a lot of sense, right? Because insulin is not so much, I said just now it was anabolic, which is kind of true, but less than, it's not as much anabolic as it is anti-catabolic, meaning that if your insulin levels are high, you simply cannot lose fat or muscle or whatever. So if you're having carbs that are keeping your insulin high, it's going to be less likely to have proper, I would define it as proper muscle turnover, which is that 1.2% or whatever the number was that he brought up earlier, right? So Without taking carbs, we want to lose 1% to 2% of our muscle mass every day, or the body wants to turn it over into fresh muscles, right? But if you're taking carbs, it can't really do that completely. And is that a positive thing? I don't think so. 
question. But then we have another study like this that adds 50 grams of carbs on top of 25 grams of protein or just a protein control and finds no difference in muscle protein synthesis. And there could be a lot of factors here. So relatively small effects. What was the amount of carbohydrate in that? Study like this that adds 50 grams of carbs. 50 grams is pretty low, right? So is that big enough to stimulate the kind of insulin response you, you would need to see that effect? I mean, not in this study, clearly. Carbs on top of 25 grams of protein or just a protein control and finds no difference in muscle protein synthesis. And there could be a lot of factors here. We could be talking about the group's weight, their exercise level, their insulin resistance itself, et cetera. But back to the actual topic at hand here of this study, no matter which way you spin this, this is a really persuasive result for people that are going, oh, I have- It's persuasive in 24 hours, right? But who was even interested in the 24 hour question? Um, and it's persuasive again in healthy middle-aged women, right? So if you're a healthy middle-aged woman, maybe this is of some interest. From this, you absolutely cannot say <laughs> that vegan sources of protein are just as good as meat for muscle protein synthesis in the long term. You absolutely cannot say that, right? You can say that what this shows is that people who were given um, a vegan meal or vegan meals seem to do as well as people who weren't in the short term in 24 hours when it comes to a certain marker <laughs> Of, um, of muscle building, right? Just one marker, right? So again, um, is it a good marker? I mean, I don't even know. It's, it's probably, you know, given that I assume these scientists knew what they were talking about, so probably they've studied the right thing. Um, but even if they had, giving them the benefit of the doubt, as I like to do, it's, it's only informing on a very, very short-term question, which is the 24-hour question. What about one month? What about one year? What about seven years, right? Have to have large amounts of animal protein at every single meal. I know several of those people uh, this study is very much saying that you don't. And next we have various satiety, fullness, hunger type scores from just qualitative responses. And so we have hunger and fullness scores, which trended slightly better for the plant groups, but they weren't statistically significantly different. However, the metrics desire to eat and could eat again, which I love, could eat again, uh, were statistically significantly better in the plant groups. And I think that's just a result so what I haven't seen is other macros here. So what's the fat ratio and so on? If, as I'm assuming, the omnivorous beef eating group had a higher percentage of fat intake, um, but they were still eating carbs, then this is totally, both of these results are completely understandable due to Randall cycle issues, energy toxicity issues, which I've talked about in other videos. Of actually having fiber in there and then also just... Talking about fiber is a complete waste of time, right? Because fiber is just indigestible plant matter. Uh, it's not relevant to the discussion. Fat intake would be relevant to the discussion. Fiber, I don't know. You, yeah, I suppose fiber is relevant in the sense that because it's indigestible plant matter, it gets broken down by bacteria and causes gas and bloating and so on. And when people are gaseous and bloating, they don't really want to eat, right? I don't know if that's a good thing again. I don't know if the lower hunger, hunger index in the group that's gassy, not sure if that's a good thing. Might be, but you'd have to show it to me. Probably an increased volume, et cetera, and carbohydrates. I think including more macronutrients contributes to satiety. And these results, in my opinion, have a huge implication for obesity. It's something we've seen over and over again that just including these things like fiber, et cetera, leads to less calorie consumption. And it's also likely- You cannot consume a single calorie. A calorie is the amount of heat needed to raise one gram of water, one degree centigrade in a bomb calorimeter at sea level. That's all the calorie is. You cannot eat it, okay? So keep that word out of your mouth, Mike. Why? From multiple studies, vegans are the ones that are hanging in there in the normal BMI range, the only dietary group doing it. Yeah, so that graph, like what the hell? Like this graph is absolutely nothing. There are studies on different kinds of diets, including a vegan diet and a Atkins diet, and there was no statistical dis difference in weight loss between those two groups, right? That's a study that was done by a vegan, Christopher Gardner at Stanford. I've made videos on that study before uh, as well, including a video on his vegan twin study that I'll link to up above studies vegans are the ones that are hanging in there in the normal bmi range the only dietary group doing that all others tend to average overweight in the us especially and all of this brings me to the question again why did they even release the results of this study when they were essentially going against their hypothesis and against what would be in the best interest of their industry which is i mean because of scientists I mean, again, Mike is seeing conspiracy theories where there may not be any. Listen, I'm as skeptical of industry funding as anyone else, um, but I also believe that most scientists are trying to do a good job. They're trying to formulate a hypothesis. They're trying to disprove their hypothesis, and they're publishing the data that they see, not what they want to see, right? The, the exception is the vegan scientists 
And you can again look at the video that I'll link to here with Christopher Gardner, where he's pretty much saying that he doesn't believe, <laughs> if you read between the lines, he doesn't think vegan eating is particularly healthy or particularly good or better than anything else, but he thinks it's good for the environment. And that's why he's recommending it, right? So to me, that's pretty dishonest. So I, and I generally, I only see that dishonesty from the sort of vegan side of the spectrum. That's not true. There's also the processed foods, people who try and muddy the waters and, and make the issue kind of cloudy. Um, but if you come with an ideology first, or if you come to sell a product, that's different than I came with an idea and I approached many people to get funding and this is how it was funded, right? The latter is just how you have to work as a scientist in the 21st century. The former is not science. The former is just confirmation bias, right? And I think assuming that these folks were in the confirmation bias piece tells us more about him and then about them, than about the scientists, than about the study. Because from what we can tell, they were pretty honest scientists. They put out the data that they saw, right? Is beef and that interest, of course, is making plant protein look like a completely inferior crap source that you don't want to rely on. If you look at all the data, you will not necessarily find that, right? You find that, so I'll bring up um, some, some studies here. You can check out this one. Um, this one is called Animal Protein versus Plant Protein in Supporting Lean Mass and Muscle Strength, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of RCTs. Even this one, it says, um, total protein intakes were generally above the recommended daily allowance of baseline. Results from the meta-analyses demonstrated that protein source did not affect the absolute lean mass or muscle strength, right? So even this one, which is, you know, the next line is going to say animal protein is better. But even this one says, look, on the whole, there's certain things that didn't change, right? But there was a favoring effect of animal protein on percent lean mass right? Um, percent lean mass basically means that if you were eating more animal protein, you tended to be leaner, right? You tended to have more lean muscle um, or non-fat mass, right? So even these kind of meta-analyses, um, which do show some benefits for eating plant protein over animal protein, they're not huge, right? It's been the narrative for decades. Now, I don't actually have the answer on this, but I can hypothesize, which hopefully my hypothesize won't be proven wrong and published uh, like theirs. Uh, but, <laughs> but they appear to have grant funding here, one of which is a NIH funded grant, which is meant to be looking at middle aged and older people and aging. They also say they were supported by University of Texas Medical. So he's saying they were forced to do the right thing. I, maybe they just wanted to do the right thing, Mike. Why, why you got to be an asshole, man? grant, I believe as well. And so the question is, did these have the stipulation that they had to release the results? I don't know. Now, maybe you just can't bury results against what you were trying to show if it's NIH funded, etc. And also makes me think of how the research meetings went. Oh, uh, yeah. So we got our results in and it appears that the uh, plant protein did just as good. So uh, we'll just bury this whole thing pretend like it never happened. What's that? We have to publish it because we took a grant money so that we could basically do discounted research to promote our products. And this brings me to the bigger picture of a lot of this research also being done specifically so that it can be blasted into a news cycle. So if we had different results, we very likely would have seen a Daily Mail article running a title along the lines of plant protein proven inferior to beef in new groundbreaking study. All vegans simultaneously die of protein deficiency. Now that's why these studies are engineered from the ground up, why they're created in the first place. And I think in this situation, even trying to use whole wheat as a protein source, uh, it still backfired. <laughs> like they tried to stack the deck and the, the deck. Yeah, again, I mean, you're going into people's motivations. Like, you're not a mind reader, dude. You don't you don't have the right to, just like I'm not trying to go into your motivations and just reacting on what you're actually saying, right? Um, I, I can't go in and say Mike is trying to paint a dishonest case. I don't know what you're trying to do, right? And in the same way, you cannot say that these researchers had an agenda in mind and they're upset that they weren't able to prove it, right? I've read, I haven't read the whole paper because it would cost $35 or something and I'm not spending that. But what I've read, the abstract and so on, just it's just usual sciencey language. There's no, there's no um, evil agenda being portrayed here in any, in any, by any stretch of the imagination. So anyway, so um, you gotta, if you're gonna make these kind of videos, Mike, you got to give people the benefit of the doubt. You have to assume that everyone is acting in good faith, because if you don't, then you look like the asshole. Make sense? Deck, deck them.
okay? And I want to frame this again within the literature that we've been seeing over the last decade or so, and even more recently. And there's a study I've mentioned a lot in terms of real people or real results that really sums this up perfectly, saying that it is the amount, not animal versus plant protein, that determines muscle mass in older adults, again, as well there, which I always say is important because protein absorption allegedly goes down and digestion can be worse when you're older. But no, plant protein does just fine. And then we have this study, which I think should just blow people's minds who are biased against plant protein. And this was one where they actually were having people do resistance training and they were eating either animal or plant protein and measuring not just muscle protein synthesis, not just muscle growth, but also actual strength improvements. And while they reported that everything was the same between the plant and animal group, I always have to mention that the incline bench results were statistically significantly better in the plant protein group. And these are people that are just normal people that were randomized to plant or animal protein. Amazing results. And this brings so again, why would we expect certain results to improve when you're moving from animal from a mixed diet, a mixed macronutrient diet, to a diet that is more low fat? I'm assuming, right? Um, again, it's to do with Randall cycle issues and energy toxicity issues. If you're having foods that are rich in both fats and carbs at the same time, your body cannot process that. Your mitochondria cannot process fuel from two different sources at the same time, and the result is for most, for the vast majority of people, the sugar is going to be burned. And the fat is going to stay in the body and not be burned and cause increased hunger, increased inflammation, all kinds of problems, right? So if you get rid of that for a short period of time, these are all short-term studies, right? For a short period of time, you will see improvements. You will see improvements in strength. You will see improvements in fitness. Fitness. You will see improvements in all kinds of things. That's regardless of the fact that the diet that you're eating is a nutrient deficient diet, right? I think everyone has to admit that a vegan diet is just nutrient deficient, right? But it takes years for those nutrient deficiencies to become clinical. So in the short-term studies, you may see some very good improvements. No one is denying that. The other thing I'll say is about protein quantity. Um, no one is, well, at least I'm not denying, I can't say what, what anyone is saying, but I'm not denying that one can meet one protein one's protein needs on a vegan diet. I'm certainly not denying that. And I did it myself for years, right? What I am saying is that that's actually much more difficult to do. And you can go and you can look on this channel. You can see uh, I reviewed a vegan high protein day of eating where the guy did pretty good. I think I think he came close to hitting what I would consider a high protein target in one meal. I used PDCAS and DIAS as calculations. Um, but even without those, like he was doing okay. Um, but in one of the meals, he totally slipped up. It was like nowhere close, but no matter how you do it, right? And I think that's the problem that most plant-based people are going to face, especially in the longer term, because these effects, if you have a protein deficient day one day, that's certainly not going to kill you. Probably not going to be bad for you. Might even be good for you. I don't know. But if you have a protein deficient day, day after day, after day, after day, after day, sooner or later that catches up with you. The question is not, can you do it? The question is how easy, convenient, how good for you is, are those things? How good for you is a nutrient deficient diet over seven, eight years? And most of us have found out, myself the hard way, don't make the same mistakes I made. That that's a really bad idea, right? And you can be ethical, <laughs> you can be healthy um, if you just ignore the vegan propaganda, the vegan religion, and eat human specific, human appropriate food, right? But that's a topic for another day. Brings me to how we're even seeing some doctors change their opinion. Doctor Ids is somebody who I generally largely agree with, and something in the past I've disagreed with him on is plant versus animal protein or superiority, whatever you want to call it. And just recently, he made a video saying that he was wrong. So good on him. So over two and a half years ago, I made a video stating that animal protein was superior to plant protein in the context of muscle building. But I was wrong, so I'm taking myself to school. Since I made my video, there has been well-controlled human studies that have made me re-look at the total evidence base, and therefore I have changed my view on this topic. So this study took 38 young men. They 38 young men. So again, not applicable to everyone. They did a 12-week training program at a... Pro 12 weeks, again, pretty short term, and 1.6 grams per kilogram per day of supplemental protein, right? This is people taking whey powder or soy powder, right? This is a very specific context. If you're going to take soy powder, you're going to have other issues. Getting your muscle mass, um, even whey protein, frankly, you're going to have other issues. Um, so I'm interested in how you can do this in a whole food kind of way. So telling me you can do it with soy protein is not particularly interesting protein intake of 1.6 grams per kilogram. And again, no differences in lean mass, cross-sectional area, or strength between vegan or meat eaters. Another control study tested pea versus whey protein for 12 weeks. Once again, no differences in... So again, we're talking about synthetic, like, synthetic protein isolates. Like, how does this tell anyone anything interesting? Um, these... 
why do I not recommend these foods? These foods tend to be, of, of course, in the short term, if you need to do something to gain weight or whatever, do whatever you got to do. But what I've seen with people who take these foods, these uh, processed protein powders in the longer term, you tend to destroy your gut health. Uh, there are heavy metals in there, which can be pretty bad. By the way, in, in the soy and the pea and the dairy ones too, although I think the dairy ones are a bit better. There are a couple brands that I do recommend to my clients from time to time. Um, maybe I'll put, I, I don't get any sponsorship or anything like that, but maybe I'll put a link to one of them down below. Um, but I don't recommend those things in general. I mean, in general, we want to be eating whole foods, right? I think everyone agrees with that. So just saying that, uh, yeah, okay, this guy was may have been wrong. There may be other data sets that disprove his hypothesis that, um, you know, that eating meat was better than eating plants for muscle protein synthesis, which I guess was his hypothesis. So maybe that that hypothesis has been disproved, but I'm not sure it's disproved by these data sets. These data sets just prove that protein isolates, whether they derive from plants or whether they derive from animal products, function similarly in the human body. That's what they seem to, they provide evidence in that direction, let's say. And strength or size between groups. So I think one thing is clear. If you're consuming an adequate amount of protein above 1.6 grams per kilogram, then all- so That's the trick. How can you do that without the powders, right? In, 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 for me as a meat eater, it's pretty easy. Um, if you're vegan, it's not easy, I promise you. And I, I say that as someone who tried to do it um, both as a vegan and as a vegetarian and largely failed I, and also succeeded and succeeded by destroying my gut health and my autoimmune got worse, et cetera, et cetera, right? So yeah, uh, the studies are not necessarily saying what he's saying they're saying. <laughs> and he's shown them on the screen so you can evaluate them. All of the evidence we have thus far suggests that animal and plant proteins are comparable for gains. So now he's straight up saying that, yeah, plant protein is adequate. It's not inferior by any meaningful metric here nowadays with all the new results. And then I also just have to mention some other benefits. Of course, you're going to be getting more positive side effects from eating plant protein. But again, they come back. Yeah, you'd have to show me some data on that. Like, I, I think he's going to talk about fiber again. Fiber is just indigestible plant matter. So, yeah, no. Packaged with antioxidants in many cases. I Most of those antioxidants are, of course, pro-oxidants. They're things that trigger the immune system, right? They're also anti-nutrients, which bind to nutrients and take them out of the system. Um, so, yeah, the you know, I, I'm not a I'm not a huge stickler for this, but you don't actually need to eat plants at all, right? Many of us have been thriving for a long time. Eating a diet, in my case, a diet of say 80, 90% animal foods. I'm not 100% carnivore, right? But there are people who've been 100% carnivore for years and are doing fine, are doing great, are in the best health of their life, have reversed autoimmune disease and so on. As well as fiber and water and things. So yeah, fiber, water. I mean, water, just drink water. Like it's not a, it's not a, it's not a nutrient, right? Fiber is not a nutrient either. Fiber is, is defined as food that you cannot eat. And if you tell me that it's food for your gut microbiota, I'll tell you that my gut microbiota have food from all kinds of sources, not just from fiber, right? Things that are going to help you be more full, you know, things that are going to help prevent diseases. We have several studies showing that plant protein reduces. So the word here is association. <laughs> um, and the other word here is cause specific mortality in the US population, right? So again, when we look at the association for countries like China, we see the opposite association. The more meat people eat in these studies or claim to eat, the healthier they are. And by the way, when you take that out, when you look at other metrics, just at how much meat is consumed in a country and plot that against longevity, you'll find that meat eating correlates with longer lifespan in 175 countries, right? Almost without exception. There are a few outliers. Um, I'll put that paper on the screen now, but it's it's an interesting data set that the more meat people, the more meat people eat at the population level, the longer that population lives. Uses mortality compared to animal protein. And then of course, there's also major environmental differences if we're looking at the carbon impact, the greenhouse gas emissions. Listen, this isn't the time to go into this thing, into this in detail, but we know that cows have been living on this planet, for example, for a lot longer than humans have. And we know that cows are part of the carbon cycle, right? They emit carbon, but they also sequester carbon through supporting grasslands, etc. The idea that cows are the problem is a really, really um, terrible idea, one that no one with any sense of integrity should be buying into. And I think we should put the focus where it needs to be, which is on fossil fuel, um, fossil fuels and so on, if you're interested in this pollution. Um, if you're interested in these issues, I think we need to talk less about cow burps um, and more about ExxonMobil, Shell, et cetera, et cetera. Footprint of animal versus plant protein, plant protein crushes in that. And then, of course, they're also these are those figures are all based on assumptions that are not valid, right? 
Um, again, so most there's there's not much data on how much carbon is sequestered by well maintained grasslands that include ruminants, right? So because a lot of those studies they're not looking beyond, I think it's 36 centimeters, um, the, the the sort of topsoil layer, and a lot of the carbon is sequestered lower than that. So I don't trust any of those data sets. I've looked at them in detail. Um, I've come to my that's the conclusion I've come to. There are groups like the Ethical Omnivore Movement and um, Soil for Climate. Seth Itzkan, uh, his group. So there are groups like that that are actually looking at this question in far more detail and finding that, yes, you actually need cows to maintain soil health, to improve soil quality, and to sequester carbon. So these, you know, these beings called animals, I think would prefer to not be killed for a protein that is... So this is the vegan fiction, like you're part of the life cycle, you, whether you like it or not. You're killing, as a vegan, you're killing animals. You're killing probably more animals than those of us who rely on big animals because it's a big animal. I'm eating only one one hundredth of it at a sitting, right? You're responsible for lots of de deaths if you're eating, you know, pesticide sprayed fields, right? And anyone who's done any gardening knows that you need the pesticides. We need some kind of uh, pest management strategy. I myself used to work on something called IPM, Integrated Pest Management Strategy. What was our main tool? Spiders, right? So I like that because we're building ecosystems, but the spiders are killing insects. Like I'm not, I'm not stupid about that, right? So if I'm eating whatever it is, an aubergine, an eggplant, um, I needed the spider to get the eggplant that wasn't already eaten by the by the worms, right? equivalent to proteins where they don't have to die. So in the end, even though I think they did stack the deck, you know, they weren't using the higher quality protein sources like soy in this study at all. And they were again using whole wheat as one of the incomplete proteins, which is, you know, a lot more incomplete than other proteins that are missing an amino acid or so. Uh, they still got results that were against their hypothesis that the plant and the animal protein were the same in terms of that muscle protein synthesis result. So I think for vegans, adequate protein, once again, is more of an issue of just adequate calorie consumption or not. Yeah, adequate calories consumption is not the right word, of course, Mike. Uh, calories, you cannot eat a single calorie, but adequate food consumption, food consumption with the right ratios, right? I think I'll stop it there because he's just repeating himself. So just a couple things to say. So there, there are lots of papers. When you look into this, you'll find lots of papers that basically show through a variety of metrics that animal-based protein is slightly better. Again, the differences aren't huge, but somewhat better than plant proteins um, if for people who are interested in building muscle, right? That's point number one. So there, it's not just, we can't just look at one study. We need to look at the data as a whole. And as I showed in the other meta-analysis that I put on the screen earlier, on the whole, there are some benefits, slight benefits, I can call them, to getting your protein from an animal-based source to, versus a plant-based source. That's point number one. Point number two is, if you want to be wholly plant-based and focus on protein, you need to be really dialed in, right? You need to know exactly how much protein is in this particular kind of lentil and rice, et cetera, et cetera, and what the balance is. So for most of us, when you're going to be hitting those protein targets, you're going to be over-consuming food, which is a problem because, you know, I was putting on weight as a vegan. I was getting obese as a vegan. My insulin was off the, off the charts. I wasn't measuring it, to be honest, but obviously my insulin was high because I was gaining one or two kilos a year, whatever it was, right? So in that context, if you want to um, hit your protein targets and be consuming a reasonable amount of food in the day, right? Um, it just it's just very difficult to do on a plant based or a vegan diet. It's just very very difficult to do. Doesn't mean it's impossible, right? Doesn't mean you can't do it. And for people who want to do it, I say go ahead. But be aware of the issues, right? Everything has a trade off. When you're eating foods that humans have not evolved to eat, right? All of these are very recent foods. And by recent, I mean the last 10, 15,000 years that they've been widely consumed. When you're eating those kind of foods, there are vitamin deficiencies that will creep in. There is, um, there, there is the issue of the Randall cycle, which means that you have to avoid certain um, high fat meals, right? That will lead to its own problems because in addition to essential amino acids, we have essential, essential fatty acids. You need to get some of your fat that's in your body some of that needs to be gained from your food. So you can't lower fat intake down to zero, which is why many of us would prefer to lower carb intake down to, if not zero, close to zero. And then we're not worried about Randall cycle trigger triggering either. We can be healthy, happy, vitamin replete, protein replete, without having to worry too much. Does that mean it's the only way? No, it's definitely not the only way. There are many ways to, to do this, but it's a healthy way to do it and it's an ethical way to do it, right? So with that, uh, uh, thanks, I'm Samir. I'll see you in the next one.